Welcome to another OCD Recovery Instagram Live. I'm going to be doing a questions and answers on here in a bit, but I thought I would talk a little bit about the recovery journey in relation to my post earlier, where I was talking about what it's what is recovery in the definition. So my post was talking about how the word recovery gets used and is often used incorrectly. Well, not so much incorrectly, but often gets given different meanings. And so there's a kind of, there's, a, there's kind of, people feel lost and they feel sort of hopeless, like they have to put up with OCD and anxiety symptoms for the rest of their life. Uh, and that OCD recovery is just learning to be more comfortable with feeling pretty crap, which it definitely is not that. So... To say going into all the parts of, about my post, if you look at the post that I posted today about recovery on the main page, uh, Instagram page, it talks, if you, if you scroll down on the post in detail, all about what's involved with the recovery process. Now, to, the main gist of it is people often refer to being recovered when they're often in a sort of a period of kind of remission. So if we look earlier on in my journey, what happened was there was a big part of my journey in, 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 along the way uh, where I thought I've definitely, I've definitely recovered now because I'm not feeling chronic anxiety, chronic intrusive thoughts. They've, those have stopped. Um, well, what happened was I would got over one fear. Nothing had come to take its place at that point. And so I was feeling pretty good. And so chronic anxiety was down. Intrusive thoughts were sort of there, but not so much. So I thought, ah, this is recovery. It wasn't. I just, it hadn't latched in a way on something yet and really got to that position. And I was sort of in that kind of, not so much coasting phase because I wasn't sort of feeling really bad symptoms at that time stuck in that. I was still, I was just, I was feeling better where I thought I'd recovered, but I was just waiting to be caught again by OCD. So that wasn't recovery. It was kind of remission. And then what happened is obviously as I went through the journey, I got a lot longer along in this, in, the, in this sort of in the journey, I got to a point where I realized, hold on, I'm at a point now with unconditional self-life acceptance and uh, not more comfortable with uncertainty and not needing to get rid of the thoughts and the anxiety and so on. And so I thought at that point, I thought, well, this is a completely different scenario to what I was in previously. Because in this position now where I am, I was in a position, well, and, and, and still am, in a position where OCD didn't have that grip anymore because there's nothing it could come up with. So let me demonstrate. If OCD get, had a really latched on sort of sticky thought, as I often say on here, that I, what happens is you, you can, some thoughts you can leave when they're not gripping, they're not really stuck. Uh, you, can, you can sort of leave them be and they're not causing a huge problem. Uh, and they, they kind of fade into the background. But sometimes you get these really sticky ones that get stuck and locked on for a very, very long time. Like I did with false memory, real event OCD. What if I hurt someone? What if I uh, really badly in the past? What if I'm going to jail? What if I'm going to get a disease, a life-threatening disease, HIV or, or cancer or something like that? The difference now is I can deeply see that not only can I see that those intrusive thoughts are what they are, but that wouldn't have unlatched it previously because previously what would have happened is even knowing, oh, this is an OCD thought, my brain would have still latched on with the 0.01% of what if it isn't, what if it's real. That's why it's latched. You can't, like, the, these books just say all the time, like, oh, just leave thoughts there. Just uh, relabel the thoughts. Well, you can't do that like they often suggest because, yes, that works partly, but it's not foolproof. And that's why so many of the books of old used to leave people stuck, including me, for years, where I was trying to relabel a thought OCD, but my brain was like, yeah, but what if it's real? On some level, I believe that. The difference now is, look, if I found out tomorrow I was going to get HIV, I wouldn't like it. It would be frustrating, but it wouldn't really change my life in a huge amount of ways. I could still do most of the things I want to do and so on. The same with a lot of illnesses and ailments and so on. So I'm not terrified of it. There's not that chronic anxious reaction in my body, which is trying to fight that off. That's not there. So because that's not there, there's no chronic cycle because I'm not terrified of it, right? That's the first part. The second part is, let's take other fears. What if I'd committed, 
not committed, but what if I had done, um, so we'll use some easier examples. What if I had uh, hurt somebody in the past in a way that I thought was really out of order, really not so good? Well, all that would happen in that situation is I could see that I'm a human being who's fallible, that could act in a way aggressively at times. And if that occurred, that would be a part of my be a behavior. It wouldn't be my totality, my value. So I could see I would still be intact. So I could see that, ah, that's a mistake. A mistake has been made, a wrong, an error, but it doesn't detract from my values. It's complete inter internally peace. There's no, none of those thoughts could come up. Now, let me just highlight for the sake of the discussion, it could be any thought, no matter how scary or act or whatever, it won't take away from that baseline peace. That baseline piece is there because I know that there's nothing to come up with. What if uh, the universe, um, there's eternal pain after death? Well, an existential thought. Well, maybe there is eternal pain after death. There could be a possibility. I highly doubt it because when the human brain's dead and, 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 and the brain has died and the body and so on, I doubt that there is anything there and I doubt that that's the case. But there could maybe, as a possibility, one in a million be. So I can go with uncertainty of maybe that's the case, maybe that will occur, but I'm not sure if that is the case and I can be okay with the uncertainty of this slim chance, I doubt it, and I can sit with that uncertainty. And I would rationally deal with that then. How? Well, rationally, does it? if I knew, do I need to know the answer to everything in the universe that's happening in the next few minutes? No. Why does it choose the end of life? And it says we must know at the end of the life what's happening, what's going to happen. Because it's a fear of fear, subtle cycle, which is trying to latch on to go, oh, you'll miss out on all your life because you'll be so focused on anxiety and being stuck for the rest of your life that then you'll miss all the, the things you want to do. So it's a self-sabotage cycle of, oh my God, what if I'm scared for the rest of my life and I can't get that thought out of my head? So on and so on. It does that, right? Now, there's so many areas. Let me just take, for example, me doing this Instagram Live. When I was, um, when I was first starting speaking and talking sort of publicly about OCD, I originally, um, I was at a point where I was recovered, so I didn't really have it latch. But I used to notice it subtly, try and catch me in times of speaking. It used to get me with this voice. What if you say, what if you I that now sort of repeat a word over and over in your head, make you have some kind of brain fog and not be able to concentrate? And so, but that point, I was able to see, well, maybe, yeah, go on, do it. Say whatever you want, scream any voice or noise or anything in your head, right? And, and, and that's okay, and I can be all right with that. However, before, I used to hate any public speaking. Oh no, what if I get completely stuck, uh, not able to speak and I lose my train of thought or I lose what I was trying to say and I can't speak and I'm completely stuck and people then think, oh God, this guy's so anxious, he can't even function and uh, what, what, what a mess that character is trying to give advice on anxiety. And that is very much what it used to try and get me with. And I remember I was, it was years ago, I was, I owned a gym at the time and I was doing a TV show for a TV show in the UK, uh, Made in Chelsea TV show. And I didn't want to be in the show, um, but they were filming it in there and they asked me to be in it for a section. And I remember coming into it and I was still suffering with OCD at the time. And I thought to myself, oh, I don't really want to speak on camera. I could lose all my, everything I'm thinking of and be completely stuck in my head and that, that, that would come Come across but I did it anyway but I didn't like it because it was it was like that OCD is looking to sabotage anything you're trying to do it's looking to sabotage anything that you're trying to go towards or any goals or anything you're doing in life like that so it's it's in the background it's trying to do that uh, and so I became aware of its ways as, as I went along on the journey and this is exactly the case now with 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 what with what I do um, I, I notice it when do I notice Say I was going to go out and do a speech to I don't know three four hundred people uh, I would maybe notice it try and come on and then I would go exposure go and do it right and what if it goes wrong and then suddenly it would be gone. I notice it, when do I notice OCD? So subtly at rare occasions. Maybe going over to the kitchen and uh, going to bed one night randomly and it will think, what have you left the gas on? Instantly in my beliefs, well, maybe the house burns down, maybe I lose the house, uh, maybe I burn to death in the house. Yeah, it could happen, there's a possibility. I'll take the risk of that. And I can genuinely see, yeah, I could take the risk of that. You know, it might happen. Uh, we're going to be dead in the future anyway, uh, so it'd be sooner than I want. 
uh, probably wouldn't be in pain for that long. I'll take the risk risk of it, even if it happened. Uh, humans have been through it. It'd be pretty painful, I imagine. But yeah, I could go through with that in reality. Yeah, so, so I'll take that risk. There's both the uncertainty and there's both the facing it in reality in my head and seeing that it really wouldn't be nice, really not what you want, but we could, we could, could entertain and be internally willing to the possibility of an occurrence. And that's key because it's the internal willingness to a, a problem that, that that's where the problem is, where we lock up and we're like, no, I don't want to ever have that situation ever occur in my head. Uh, ever and then that is what keeps you stuck because you think I don't want to ever have that possibility even entering the realm of my consciousness and then we push it away and we know I don't want that anywhere near and that's what gets us stuck because we're trying so hard to have everything perfectly calm in our head at all times that we, we, we get stuck because we're trying to keep the world perfect okay I'm going to bed now okay the world needs to be even more perfect my internal world I'm talking about Okay, so every, the lights are off. The, the, I don't give a damn about lights. Lights are never, never an issue now. But when I was a kid and OCD was in when I was young, that's where it used to get me on. Okay, the lights off. Are you in bed right? Are you feeling comfortable? Only then can you sleep. And that's how it links in. Um, and so we, we, I'm talking here about the contrast from all the different things it can latch to, from, from the situations where I really do need to get a bloody tripod. I left it at the other place I was and... I, I, I just started using it and it's the best thing because then I don't get a bad neck from holding this uh, phone. So I've got to do that. I've got to remember to do that. Um, just in case you wanted to know that. Uh, so yeah, I, I do think that with, with OCD, what you've got to really think about is the only reason people are stuck and the only reason information is misinformed is because people, what happens is people who are not recovered, uh, they, they often, they'll say they're recovered because they think that's as good as it can get. But that isn't as good as it can get. It can get a lot better than that. And so it's important to say what recovery is. Recovery by definition is the absence of all chronic anxiety and the absence of intrusive thoughts, not intrusive thoughts themselves. You'll always get them as humans do, but they'll lose their intrusive that sort of like bullet-like impact that they have where they're sort of coming in coming into your head at sort of 100 miles an hour where you feel like you're never going to get that feeling or that thing out of your head ever again and it's just repeated bang 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 over and over and over again in your head that's what it used to be like the worst I used to have was real event false memory OCD those ones not just that sort of in that gap that space of real event false memory I used to be completely stuck in there it used to always all the time bombard with you can't relax for a second you can't have a second off you're stuck like this for the rest of your life this you you can't even breathe you can't even be at peace and relax in, in your bed or on the couch because after what you've done you should feel guilty 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 all day long that is exactly what it was trying to do all the time so it was only when I got to a place of starting to move towards unconditional self-acceptance, I saw, well, hold on, I wouldn't hold myself to these, I, I, I hold myself to these sort of old draconian-like uh, judging, way of judging things, where I'm sort of judge and executioner, sabotaging myself 24-7. Whereas <clears throat> if we went to somebody else who'd committed a crime, I could accept them and see, look, they made a mistake, I could understand, I could, could see them, I could have compassion. But for me, I couldn't have compassion. For me, it was like, there's no compassion. What you've done, nothing. And so I was speaking to myself in this sort of army general-like tone in my head with no compassion. And that's what was fueling it so much. And that's what I realized over time. You've got to take it with a one day at a time approach. It's got to be a relatively tough love in terms of keeping yourself going, cutting out compulsions, rumination, cutting out confession, all these kinds of things. But at the same time, you've got to be kind to yourself. You didn't choose to have OCD. You didn't choose this journey. This journey can be very difficult. And you've got to be kind to yourself along that journey. You know, that's a very, very, very key point. Because otherwise, where are you getting yourself speaking to yourself so horribly? You know, what is that doing? Is that making you feel better? What's the point of punishing yourself when you're already suffering from a disorder? You wouldn't have cancer and then go, oh, I'm so useless for having cancer. People do do that, even with cancer, because it's so much a trait of, of humans to sort of beat ourselves up and turn things inwards. So we've got to watch that. We've got to observe that and be very careful with that, because it's very easy to do that and get into that cycle. Uh, right, now let's have a look at some of these questions. Got to go back a bit now, find them. 
Is it normal to have constant mind pops, thoughts that don't feel like mine? Well, what you're referring to there is very much just intrusive thoughts in general, because intrusive thoughts, intrusive thoughts in general are going to feel very intrusive. They're going to come in with intrusive urges, intrusive sensations, intrusive everything. That's the very nature of it, you know? That's what it does. It feels like that. If it didn't feel like that, it wouldn't be an issue. It's because it feels so intrusive in its ways. It, it, it can pop out of anywhere, it can come out of anywhere, uh, it can create any sensation. With the schizophrenia type OCD, it can create the sensation of a feeling like you've got an internal almost voice or sound or image. Uh, it's not obviously the same as schizophrenia uh, symptoms, but it can, because OCD is the master at mimicking, it can feel very, very, very much like that at the time. When you're in it, you can feel like, how am I ever, ever going to get out of this sensation? Or this sensation must be absolutely real. There must be this, because there's no other way that, that, that this could be anything but the thing that I fear. Uh, and it, it, no matter how irrational that thing is, no matter how ridiculous that thing is, it will make that thing feel like the most real thing that you can, you can possibly imagine. Let's have a look through some of these. My mind tells me that I'm a terrible person. There is no terrible humans, okay? Let's just get that straight. There is no humans in reality, in life, that are terrible. None. Even the mass murderers, the serial killers, all of them, they are not terrible people. They are human beings that are human. First, they have value for being intact and human. They act in ways that are very wrong in our society and have very bad effects in our society. And we really do, we do, not, want, we do not want those actions in our society. And we have to deal with them in the best way we can and help them as best way we can and rehabilitate people if we can. Um, and we have to do those things. But it doesn't make the person terrible. They have value for being alive and human. The act is wrong. The human is still intact. And that takes practice to see. A great video for that is Albert Ellis, the founder of CBT's videos on guilt and shame. If you go on YouTube, you type in Albert Ellis, guilt and shame. There's a great three-part video. It's been up there for about 10 years, maybe 14 years or something. I remember seeing it probably about that long ago. It's a very, very important one to me. It made me realize that all humans have value. All humans. And it's a very key point to see that. For somatic OCD, please check out our YouTube channel. Nick has got loads of great videos on our channel there talking all about sensory motor and somatic OCD. I'm not talking at the moment just because I'm reading through these questions and I have to scroll through them all and find out uh, what, what people were asking. Any advice how to concentrate? Well, the problem that happens with concentration is that people become so obsessed with concentrating that they then, it makes OCD mimic, and knows that they're scared of not concentrating, so it creates lots of confusion and problems around the fear of not being able to concentrate. So the person then gets stuck because OCD is making it feel like they can't concentrate. OCD can mimic forgetting things. So all these things occur. And because of that, you end up getting stuck because you're trying so damn hard to make sure that you can concentrate properly. There's a great video about trauma and OCD by Momin on the YouTube channel talking about that in detail in relation to himself uh, and in relation to, uh, there's a common question people think, oh, but what if there's something in my past that's keeping me stuck that if I don't know, uh, cue the psychodynamic model of trying to work to get better from OCD of, oh, maybe there's something with your mother or something like that in the past. Okay, if it's something at the forefront the individual is very much scared of or something that's quite apparent, Often not super apparent, but usually sort of you're, you're going to have some gauge that there was a problem there. Uh, it's not something buried and hidden in the past that you need to go over your past for hours and hours and hours at, 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 or years and years and years in sessions looking for that one thing. Because that itself is a compulsion in the OCD cycle, constantly trying to work out what that thing was. 
because if you don't uncover that thing, which is by the very nature an OCD sort of hunting, rumination type thing, if you don't find that thing, you're going to be eternally stuck, which you can imagine compulsion. Real event OCD, watch Oliver's videos, they're very good on the YouTube channel talking all about POCD, real event OCD, chronic latch guilt, all that kind of stuff. So he's got some great videos on our YouTube channel on the OCD recovery page. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so and to this page. Uh, it always helps us spread the word about OCD and increase awareness about OCD and having a good understanding of what's involved in recovery. Um, I'm having... Does everybody have intrusive thoughts? That's a bit of a reassurance question. Yes, everyone does. But if you just scroll back on this Instagram Live, it's going to be posted on YouTube in a bit, uh, you'll see that although everybody does have intrusive thoughts, with OCD, they've got uh, their sort of more uh, intruding and repetitive and can't turn them off. It's a different type of sensation. Everyone has thoughts that come out of nowhere, but they don't have the kind of thing that we're experiencing, how ours has this sort of intrusiveness that keeps coming in. Uh, it's a different sensation is very different with us uh, as to how they feel it. They feel it, it sort of intrudes, but with no weight behind it. That's the, that's the situation. Tips for handling panic attacks. There's a good video on our channel about that as well, so you can check that out there. Groinal responses as well. Oliver covers that in his video talking about groinal responses and taboo-related OCD. Uh, hi Rob, how do I get over obsessed about a girl? Well, obsessed about a girl, this is, uh, this can come into obviously ROCD, what if I can never get over it, can be fear of fear too, what if I'm stuck in the cycle and never ever get back to a position of ever being able to be at peace with that situation having occurred and being consumed in my mind. There's a lot of songs in the music industry written, the whole music industry is pretty much related to getting over uh, a past love. Uh, you know, that's part of, part of life that we do gradually get over with time, we have memories, but not sort of held in a chronic, uh, in a chronic format. That doesn't, doesn't do that. However, what you're doing is, and then probably because you're on this page, is because you're in a sort of OCD cycle in relation to that. What if I never get over this? What if this affects my current relationship? What if I've missed the one opportunity I had, the so-called one uh, concept, man-made, human-made concept of there being one human for all of us and no other human, so if we've missed that one chance. Well, if that was the case, our grandparents would have never had us because the chance of them coming together and meeting, uh, meeting the so-called one would be so rare that no one ever would. Um, <clears throat> We cover a lot of those kind of concepts and things all in the ROCD playlist on the YouTube channel. If you check that out, it goes into that in great detail. Um, P what does self-acceptance look like for POCD sufferers? Uh, again, Oliver's video goes into great detail about that. I know I'm highlighting a few videos on our channel, but it's because in this Instagram Live, I haven't got enough time to cover these sort of quite broad topics. So Oliver goes into that in great detail about what is involved in that and all the sort of getting under the sort of sticky core fears that are around the bottom there, holding that latched with chronic guilt and chronic anxiety long term. So check that out. That's a great thing. That's a great uh, those playlists and those videos by Oliver are very, very good for that subject. Uh, also, we do have POCD webinars coming up. We have a lot of different webinars running every few weeks uh, covering all the different topics. There's one coming up on ROCD. There's one coming up on POCD. There's one coming up on unconditional self-acceptance. There's one com coming up on how to recover from OCD in general. All different aspects of the journey. Existential OCD, one coming up. We'll be doing ones on sensory motor and so on. So we're trying to cover every single aspect of the OCD recovery journey, all the different themes. There's so much to talk about each section. So we try and break them up so that you, you can get the information for the particular one that, that, that bothers you currently, but also giving you a broad understanding because it does tend to morph and shift. Guys, great to have you all here. I'll be uploading this to YouTube in a bit, and I will see you on another Instagram Live in the next few days. I'll be back on here doing a lot more of these, so I will see you guys then. All right, guys, take it easy. See you later.